Okay, uh, welcome to Beta Males, Tyranny's Fertilizer. <laughs> How's that for a synopsis? <laughs> like Tyranny's Fertilizer. Okay, uh, welcome, thank you all for coming. First off, you know, I'm, I'm talking about manhood, maleness, and so forth, so to backtrack a little bit to genetics and gender and the sexes, I, I don't buy the notion that uh, men and women are the same in every way, that men are some sort of incomplete woman in training, that there's no difference between men and women. There are. If anyone's had children, especially the mother of the children will know, even from a few weeks or months into the birth, that this baby boy gravitated naturally to toy trucks and the baby girl gravitated naturally to, you know, dolls, okay? This isn't merely social conditioning, right? This isn't merely nurturing. There's stuff that's in us, maleness or, or femaleness, to varying degrees. So from that, from the outset, I'm going to read something from 1971, an author, authoress named Taylor Caldwell. Heard of Taylor Caldwell? She wrote a lot of stuff back in the day. She's deceased now. Uh, interesting woman, a British uh, uh, immigrant with her family, 1905, I think she was born, raised in uh, New England. Anyway, she grew up tough, as her autobiography says, on growing up tough. And at the end of the book, she said, this is 1971, there was a time, even in my remembrance, when American men were manly, heads of their houses, and respected by their wives and children. They were rugged and hard-nosed, and not swathed in a pink soft jello. A thief was a thief to them and not a disadvantaged or underprivileged culturally deprived weakling. She said, I've seen men beat up other men who attempted to snatch a woman's purse on the public streets or who kicked a dog or who punched a child. When men are unmanned spiritually if not physically, then a country becomes depraved, weak, degenerate, feeble of spirit, guideless, sick. Such a country can never resist authoritarian despots, tyranny, the men on horseback, communism. Remember this, the strongest sign of decay in a nation is the feminization of its men and the masculinization of its women. The decay and ruin of a nation is always laying in the hands of its women. So does, so does its life, its strength, its reverence for beauty, its mercy and kindness of above, of above, of above all for its men. 1971. Seventy years before that, Theodore Roosevelt said, unless we retain the barbarian values, gaining the civilized ones will be of little avail. This is why France got conquered in six weeks by the Nazis in 1940, and Poland had held out for almost that long, okay? Because they fought harder, and France had, France had given up before the war had ever started, so. What is an alpha male? Um, I think there's a lot of confusion about that or overreaching about the term. An alpha male is not necessarily a linebacker for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He's not necessarily looking like Fabio. He's not Eric the Red, the Norseman, a marauder or something that's a, uh, an exaggeration of masculinity. An alpha male is a man who is physically and emotionally capable of dealing with life at all levels. He defends and he enlarges his own sphere of life, and he's daily willing to do so. He is a walking solution. This is my version of what manhood is. An alpha happens to life. Now, a beta male is neither so capable or willing to defend or enlarge his sphere of life. Life happens to betas. A beta doesn't happen to life. Do you see the difference, the distinction? And there's kind of a watershed to it. It's not like there's a continuum from the weakest beta to the strongest alpha, and then you, you sort of magically, with one angstrom of, of madness, change into an alpha when you were the, the highest of betas. I think there's a gap between the two. An alpha male is not dominant in order to dominate, but rather he's selectively dominant in order just to accomplish what needs to be done. He knows when to rule and when to obey. An alpha is accepted amongst other alphas although with occasional power struggles. Now, a beta is tolerated amongst alphas if he's useful. We're not being too much of a pain in the ass. A beta, and here's the real definition, a beta male is, is a male who generally has to rely upon other men, either to keep his life running, to defend himself, to feed himself, and so forth. 
I'll tell you uh, two stories and you'll get a contrast between alpha males and beta males. It was in uh, Mexico a long time ago on a motorcycle trip and we had a beach party at dinner uh, at the beach. This is near Ixtapa, not far from uh, what's now Narcapulco. Got the door closed here. Anyway, so they've got uh, tiki torches and long tables and a really nice banquet outside. I'm sitting here, my girlfriend is sitting to uh, my right, um, an older couple is to my left, the wife and the husband, and my girlfriend happens to be leaning over the table, I think talking to her, and she says in a perfectly formed sentence, without any emotion, there's a scorpion crawling on your left shoulder to the woman. And by the time I had looked over, you know, process what she said, because it happened right next to me, I processed what she, and looked over, her husband was all instant action and whap, knocked the thing right off her shoulder, barehanded. Former Marine, of course. Instant action, while I'm still like, Scorpio, that's kind of, well, what's, you know, just looking over like that. He's just immediately, not even thinking, rushed and solved the problem. Alpha or beta, what do you think? Alpha. All right, another story, and pretty recent, I don't know the guy, but I heard the story, because it's a good one. Um, a husband and his young son go outside to barbecue, and they open the barbecue, and there's a mouse. And he and the son run inside <laughs> in terror from the mouse in the barbecue and have mom do it while they peek out the window as mom handles the mouse in the barbecue. Not, no, 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 <laughs> not at all. That's right, yeah. Uh, you know, a mouse, you can pick a mouse up by the tail. Anyway, it's not in the book. This is just a freebie here for the, for the talk. You just pick it up by the tail. It's not a prehensile tail. You can just pick it up by the tail and chuck it out. So uh, another story, and this was, with, was within the same uh, environment. This is a collection of uh, shooting instructor, uh, instructors, martial arts instructors, about 10 years ago, got together for kind of a, a confab, right? Kind of, I think it was a full weekend. And so you had some uh, big names in the shooting industry that were there. And then afterwards, the instructors got together because they were staying like in a bunkhouse. So, you know, it's all men there, right? Had a hard day instructing, drinking whiskey, grilling steaks, you know, sitting around in your underwear, scratching, farting, drinking, you know, it's kind of a man's thing. And one of the guys, this instructor that we've always kind of went, eh, I don't know about this guy. <laughs> he shows up, he, 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 he wanders down in full on pajamas including the hat, the long hat with a tassel at the end, like the Rip Van Winkle hat, comes downstairs. We're like, what the fuck? It's like, is this a joke? Come on, this is funny. Like, come, just comes on down. It's like, da -da 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 -da. just not getting it, you know? Just not quite there. A shooting instructor, but, you know, it's just like, he's the king of the betas, we'll give him that, you know, in, re in retrospect. But it's like, wow, okay. I mean, he could, you know, if he was an alpha, if he came down as an alpha wearing that, we would have thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, but you'd have to know Andy to know that. Yeah, he wasn't trying to be Andy. Right. Right. Okay, looking back uh, historically on what is a man, what has a man done generally in life, it's pretty common across cultures, across millennia. Uh, in general, a man is known for his strength, his courage, his mastery of something and his honor. So I'm going to talk about those four things. Strength is the ability to exert one's will over oneself, over nature, and over people. All right. This, this is absent of, of any moral consideration. This is just pure ability to exert your will. Right. A quote from uh, Jack Donovan's The Way of Men, a very, a very good book. It's small and uh, I think only nine bucks on, on Amazon. Great book. In dire times, men who are not good at being men won't last long enough to worry about being good men. Strength makes all other values possible. Okay? You have to have strength first before you can consider any kind of action and how you use it and how you restrain it. Uh, the next item is courage. Courage is the will to risk harm in order to benefit oneself or others. To risk harm in order to benefit. Mastery is a man's desire and ability to cultivate and demonstrate proficiency and expertise and techniques that aid in the exertion of will over himself, over nature, over women, and over other men. Okay? 
Um, a good story about mastery I like to tell is from the samurai days. There was a marketplace in China, bustling with people. There was a, a, a Jap Japan, not China. And um, a tea master, a tea serving master, right? They exist in that culture. Bumped the sword of the samurai just in the crowd. And the samurai was kind of a cranky old bastard, and so he made a big issue of it. And he's like, you know, I'll see you at dawn at the crossroads. And so the tea master is, is of course, terrified at the prospect of this, because there's no way to win. He doesn't have a sword, doesn't know how to use it. So he's talking to a friend about this, quavering about it. And his friend said, well, serve, serve us some tea. Let's talk about this. So the tea master goes into his routine of serving the tea, of which he is a master. Right? There's a way to do it, the tea you select, the right cups, how you move, how you present it, how you set it down, and, and so forth. So he goes into that zone to serve tea, and, he, and his whole being changes because he plugged into that one part of mastery that, that he does have. And his friend said, show him that face. So the tea master goes at dawn to the crossroads with that face, with that still in him, and the badass samurai comes right up to him and stares him in the face and says, I cannot defeat you, turns and walks away. So mastery of anything is important to a man, even if you just serve tea, okay? because it's part of you as a master of something. And if a male is not master of, of anything, and merely good at something, but a master of nothing, he's, he's not tapped into something deep you know, within himself as a man. And he can't use that to springboard into other areas of mastery. So mastery is uh, really core, and it has to be uh, handled early. Uh, the last of the four, honor. Honor is a concern for one's reputation for strength, courage, and mastery within the context of an honor group comprised primarily by other men. This is where beta males really sh uh, shirk their duty. They know they don't have much strength or courage or mastery. And so the last thing they're going to do is go find you know, some honor group of men who are better than he is because he, he knows they're going to kind of laugh at him. It's like, what are you doing here? You know, you've got nothing to author, offer us. We, we can't rely upon you. This is the thing about honor, um, especially heterosexual males versus metrosexual or homosexual males. What that other class of men doesn't get is that men who are flamboyantly dishonorable are flagrant in their disregard for the esteem of their male peers. This is why the pajama boy, you know, the shooting instructor thing, kind of turned everybody off. What we often call effeminacy is a theatrical rejection of the masculine hierarchy and manly virtues. Masculinity is a religion. It's religious. And flamboyantly dishonorable men are blasphemers. Flamboyant dishonor is an insult to the core values of the male group. You know, I never really thought of it that way, but when, when I read that, it's like, yeah, I, I knew that all along. I never, you know, enunciated it that way. But this is why a beta male is just not going to wander into an alpha male kind of group or situation and, and be accepted. It's like, you haven't proven yourself. You know, where's your strength? Where's your courage? Where's your uh, mastery? Show me your track record. How do we know we can rely on you in the crunch? If the car breaks down, if marauders come, if the boats sink, you know, are you dead weight or are you helping out? You know, we got to know. You know, the male tribe has to know. Ayn Rand said in her speech to West Point in 1974, honor is self-esteem made visible in action, which I think is uh, pretty good. Um, a couple of vignettes about 20th, 20th century American uh, manhood. My favorite probably is the revolt in Athens, Tennessee, right after World War II. Anybody familiar with that story? Yeah. That's a good one. You had World War II vets from Athens, Tennessee, a fairly small town. They come back. They had defeated the Nazis, defeated the Japs, come back, and they just want to get on with life and start a family and you know, you know, live in a in a decent world. Uh, their their town, their area was was quite corrupt. Elections were rigged, and uh, they actually these World War II vets had to go to arms to force out the corrupt politician. They took things in their own hands. Something probably wouldn't happen in 2018, but they sure did it in 1947 or whenever it happened. Uh, great story. I was just thinking of the Bundy Ranch. That's, that's the most recent example. It, didn't, it came to arms, but not uh, gunfire, and that's fine. Yeah, I'm glad no one got killed. 
But uh, at least, you know, finally someone shows some balls. You know, it's like, good deal. The American Revolution. You know, if you read of how that started, Lexington and Green, anybody been to Lexington and Green in Massachusetts? It's, it's hallowed ground. Did you feel that, Frank? You get there, it's like hallowed ground. You had basically British marching from Boston westward to confiscate guns and cannon and gunpowder. It was a gun confiscation grab. Word got out from Paul Revere and, and others, Richard Dawes, and so they mustered the militia, who were just basically farmers with musket loaders, but they had trained a little bit and all that. Uh, they didn't fire the first shot in Lexington. Uh, some got killed. They fell back, and then at Northbridge and so forth, they rallied, and you had thousands of these militiamen, just common men, uh, coming to the defense of their liberties. And they fought the British back to the boats. I've walked Battle Road. Did you go down Battle Road and walk it? I mean, some of the houses are still there. The Bloody Angle, they call it. There's a particular corner that was a lot of fighting called the Bloody Angle. Uh, that's all still there. And it's like, wow, they fought them 30 miles back to the boats. And they would have killed them all, except the British took a, a quick turn one direction that the militiamen didn't expect, and they, and they got free. Um, huge strength, courage, mastery, and honor. Uh, a badass, and that was a guy named Samuel Whittemore. I think he was 75 at the time. This is 1775. He killed three Brits. He got bayoneted. They left him for dead because they thought they'd killed him. And then uh, he survived 20 years after that until like 92. I mean, amazing badass. Whether we can get people like that back uh, is another story. Robert Heinlein, we all know who he, who he was. Uh, he gave an address in 1973 to the Naval Academy, and this is a great story. He grew up in um, Kansas City, Missouri. So he's talking about uh, Swope Park. It's a big park that's 1,500 acres in Kansas City. He said, in my hometown 60 years ago, when I was a child, my mother and father used to take me and my brothers and sisters out to Swope Park uh, in the afternoons on Sunday. It was a wonderful place for kids with picnic grounds and, and lakes and a zoo, but a railroad line cut straight through it. One Sunday afternoon, a young married couple were crossing these tracks. She apparently did not watch her step, for she managed to catch her foot in the frog of a switch to a siding and could not pull it free. Her husband stopped to help her, but try as they might, they could not get her foot loose. While they were working at it, a tramp, anybody know what a tramp is? We don't use that word anymore. You know, tramp, a bum, right. A tramp uh, stopped by to help her while he was walking the ties. He joined the husband in trying to pull the young woman's foot loose, but there was no luck. Out of sight, around a curve, a train whistled. Perhaps there might have been time to run and flag down the train and stop it, perhaps not. In any case, both men went right ahead trying to pull her free, and the train hit them. The wife was killed, the husband was mortally injured and died later, and the tramp was killed. And the testimony showed that neither man made the slightest move or effort to save himself. Now, the husband's behavior was heroic. He was the husband. That was his wife. But what we expect of a husband towards his wife, his right, his proud privilege to die for his woman. But what of this nameless stranger? Up to the very last second, he could have jumped clear. He didn't know this woman, but he didn't. He was still trying to save the woman he had never seen before in his life, right up to the very instant the train killed him. And that's all we'll ever know about him. This is how a man dies, and this is how a man lives. And what the third wave butchy feminists don't realize is that masculinity is voluntarily self-sacrificial. We don't mind the mantra, women and children first. We have no trouble with that whatsoever. A beta male will be like, eh, I don't know, in the Titanic, yeah, it was the Titanic. There are cases of men donning women's clothes in order to get on the lifeboat. And that was in 1912. Uh, even in the allegedly oppressive institution of Christian marriage, in Ephesians, the husband has eight duties that are commanded of him. The wife has only four. But of the husbands, one of them is to lay his life down for his wife, as Christ did for the church. A Christian husband is commanded to die for his family if necessary. That's not required of the wife. Historically, men have been expected to protect, 
to provide and to procreate. I'm going to only talk about the protection part because if you can't protect what you provided for or your children, it doesn't really matter that you have provided or you have children. If you can't protect them, they're gone. So I'm just going to talk about protection for a moment. Um, one of my mentors in the shooting industry uh, deceased about uh, 12 years ago, Jeff Cooper, Thunder Ranch. Anybody here of Jeff Cooper? Seminal figure in self-defense mindset. Uh, a couple of quotes from him. The only acceptable response to the threat of lethal violence is immediate and savage counterattack. If you resist, you, just, you may just get killed. But if you don't resist, you almost certainly will get killed. It's a tough choice, but there's only one right answer to the problem. And then he said something like about uh, handguns. A pistol is a weapon of astonishing efficiency and versatility when skillfully used. But its skillful use is rare. And now this is odd when you think of it, for while the pistol is commonplace throughout the, quote, civilized world, only the merest handful of men now or in the past has ever approached the ability to make it do what it can. And as a shooting instructor, that's true. I can tell you that that's true. Merely owning a gun, uh, it's good that you own one. It's better that you carry it, but you need a lot of training to get out its potential. You know, just because you have a Steinway, that doesn't make you a pianist. He goes on to say, a really good man wearing a really good sidearm in a, is a serious, almost insurmountable problem for any person or group which contemplates his forcible coercion. He may be safely taken with poison gas, a tank, or a precision rifle under certain circumstances, but that's about all. Back in the 1870s, Arizona lawman John Clum was advertising for deputies. And in, in his ad, he said, I love this, be prepared to join the fray with disconcerting alacrity and deadly effect. Alacrity means I don't give a shit, you know, goes this way, goes that way, whatever, man. And if you have that attitude in a fight, it is disconcerting to your opponent. You know, when the urine is not running down your leg and you're just like, eh, whatever. I'm thinking of the, the uh, Charles Bronson grin. Anybody see Charles Bronson movies? <laughs> when he was up against it, he just had this kind of smirk, just kind of, okay. Stoic badassery. May it not go out of style. George Orwell said, people sleep peaceably in their beds at night only because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. Okay. And Heinlein, uh, this quote is uh, famous, the price of freedom is the willingness to do sudden battle, sudden battle, anytime, anywhere with utter recklessness. So a beta male with a gun is probably untrained. He doesn't have the mindset, right? He can't do sudden battle, even though he has a gun. It, probably the gun will be taken away from him. So it, it matters who carries it and why. Just putting a handgun on a beta, uh, you know, he, he's better off without it, I guess, but uh, not by much. Uh, the inherent low-grade conflict between gender personalities. Men want to solve problems, however painfully, and then move on. Uh, women, however, and I'm making generalities here. Yeah. Women, however, in general, value agreeableness above all else. They're usually conflict averse, and that's fine. There's sometimes when you know a peacemaker needs to show up, and, and in a marriage, uh, it's great where the wife can smooth things over that the husband either started or exacerbated or didn't you know tone it down. So there's nothing wrong at times with solving conflict. However, there's sometimes where conflict has to be solved aggressively. Uh, conflict disturbs women probably because they realize their inherent physical disadvantage in it. Uh, men, however, see value in conflict, and a subset of men actually seek conflict. Uh, most probably don't seek it, but they don't shy away from it either. That would be me. Uh, beta males, like most women, are conflict averse. Uh, within families, men were historically responsible for production, women for distribution within the family. Politicized estrogen can't help but build on that tendency. This is why you have feminists in uh, liberal politics trying to distribute shit that isn't theirs. All right? they, they think it's fair that everyone gets the same. To, to them, that's uh, equality and fairness. Men in the animal kingdom do not protect the culls, the weak and the incompetent starve or get killed. You know, that's just uh, the rough world. 
technology. We're in the 21st century, and uh, technology is a double-edged sword, and I think it's got a lot of curse attached to it. Uh, technology crowds out masculinity, and I'll, I'll explain why. This is a quote from uh, Mansfield, Book of Manly Men, Stephen Mansfield. He says, gentlemen, let's admit it. Most of us are tragically over-domesticated. We have hardly any connect connection to the wild or to our wilder selves. Words like adventure, exploit, and quest no longer apply to us. It's why we are soft, whiny, and bored. God made me to live a fully engaged life and to press against some frontier, push myself beyond my ease, and let my soul, soul feel against a threat. My first-class airplane seat, my Hilton hotel room, steak at Morton's, iPad addicted, way over lauded life is not helping me to be this kind of man. Uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who wrote The Black Swan and other books, he said the opposite of manliness isn't cowardice. Guess what it is? It's technology. It makes you soft. Jack Donovan, Way of Men, said civilization comes at a cost of manliness. It comes at a cost of wilderness, of strife, of strength. It comes at a cost of strength or courage of mastery. It comes at a cost of honor. Increased civilization exacts a toll on virility, forcing manliness into further redoubts of vicariousness and abstraction. Anybody feel that way, you know, as men here? It's like, you know, you got these nice toys and all that, but it buys you off somewhere else. I think there's an eternal war against men and masculinity. I think evil is against men and masculinity because basically men are the ones to fight evil with women's help, of course, and with women actively uh, getting into the fray, like Joan of Arc, for example. The war against men and masculinity, it's waged by those who either distrust masculinity, masculinity which is 20 or 30 percent of women, or cannot exhibit masculinity, which is probably 40 plus percent of males. They both feel threatened by it. These two classes are natural allies, the beta males and the feminists, and they now outnumber alpha males and their mates. So this is really coming to the fray uh, these days. The, the Women's March in January of 2017 um, wasn't just an anti-Trump thing. This was an anti-man uh, thing. You heard Ashley Judd talking about the, the I think of the quote, it's so insane. The, the testosterone-dripped blades slicing at my salary and tampons are taxed, but Viagra isn't, and, you know, this kind of nuttiness. It's like, whoa, come on, you know. Nuts, if you, if you heard any of that, you know, from the speaker uh, rostrums of the, uh, of the march. Now we've got the rise of the beta male. And these are people who abjure violence. And they only do so because others are committing violence on their behalf, as George Orwell said. Um, you know, now the males are more interested in fashion. They're more interested in just the soft, feminine things of life. Uh, as a pilot, I land at airports and they have these really nice, expensive, glossy magazines like uh, Rob Report or Elite Traveler and all that. And so um, I picked up an Elite Traveler, July, August 2016 edition, <laughs> just to see what I'm missing. And it says, Take the flare pant from the 1970s, oversized suiting from the 1980s, add a touch of androgyny, and you'll find today's relaxed silhouette. You know, this is what they're pimping to, the, to men these days. Alpha males dress primarily for working function, tactical value, versus for pure fashion. It's not an accident that I'm wearing earth tone, um, you know, colors. You know, I can, I can kind of melt away, you know, with earth tone stuff. I can't if I'm wearing something really garish in color and all that. Uh, it's not an accident. I'm wearing shoes that I can run or fight in. I don't wear flip-flops where I go because I can't run or fight in flip-flops, but I can get somewhere in these. Um, I've got stuff on my belt that can get me out of trouble. I think it's important to have a handgun, a tactical light, a fixed blade knife, a multi-tool, a um, thousand bucks in cash, a credit card with you know, 10,000 bucks on it, a uh, backup knife, neck knife here. And I wear it, you know, cost a few thousand bucks, weighs a few pounds. After a while, I don't notice it anymore. But with this stuff, I can't have problems. There's no such thing as a problem, you know, in my daily world that can affect me. I can fight, fix, buy, or flee my way out of almost anything. And if my handgun is not enough, I go to my car and get my rifle. And yeah, I travel with a rifle. So, um, 
after a while, I just get used to this. It, 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 there's no more, I don't feel the weight. I don't feel the cost. I, I have the, just the contentment of going, I can go anywhere I want to. I can do anything I want to. And this is something anyone could afford or anyone could be trained in. Euro weenie story, um, before I get into beta male descriptors. Years ago, I was in uh, what shall remain an unnamed European country, visiting old friends. They had just had uh, their second child. So they had a son who was about four, the daughter was two. So I hadn't seen him in years. Hey, how's it going? You know, I was catching up with him. And the mom told me a very uh, disturbing story. Just the past week before I got there, the son had been orally sodomized by a neighbor. And we know this is true because when a four-year-old son says, Mommy, Mr. So-and-so put his penis in my mouth and something like milk came out, there's no lie to that or, or invention. I, I honestly had to sit down when I heard this. I, I was so shocked and overwhelmed, I had to sit down. And I went to the father and I said, I said well, back to backtrack, I said, well, what happened to the, the neighbor? You know, is he in prison? They prosecute him? No, I mean, police, you know, interviewed him, but they said there wasn't enough evidence. They wouldn't make him take an AIDS test. It didn't go anywhere. And we were, you know, we were walking. This is how it came up, because we walked past his place, and she told me about it. I said, you know, why isn't there even a broken window in this guy's house? I mean, where's the outrage, and you know, what's going on? So we got back to uh, their apartment, and I talked to the father, and I, and I said, uh, you know, she told me about what happened to the boy. I said, do you, do you want some help dealing with this guy? And at first he didn't know what I was saying. He, it, it didn't compute. And I said, do you want some help dealing with this guy? Oh, no, no, we, we can't take the law into our own hands, was basically his, his response. I mean, how do you stay married to a pussy like that that would let his son get attacked without any recourse? And they divorced uh, not too long after that. Um, there's got to be a father's revenge, a father's justice for stuff like that. I think anybody with children, and there are a few here that I know, should put the word out. The father should put the word out casually, you know, without any, you know, edge to it. Anything happens to my children, the perpetrator better pray that the police catch up to them before I do. And just put that word out, and that will help put a shield, a protective shield around the children. There has to be a father's energy in life to protect his family. So. Now to what you've all been waiting for, the beta male descriptors. I know you're, you're looking for like a Jeff Foxworthy, <laughs> you know. If you own more neckties than firearms or knives, you just might be a beta male, you know, it's, but that's true. If you're a leftist, depending on the welfare state, if you consume more than you produce, if you're pulling, if you're not pulling your weight, but leech off of others, if you blame society for your lack of success, if you're financially supported by a woman, I met a woman last night who's divorcing her husband who was just a household uh, layabout, I think is a fair way to put it. She made the money and he, and he just sat on his ass. If you spend more time gaming than at the gun range, if your shirt is untucked, but not to conceal a handgun, this is a personal one of mine. I, <laughs> I hate untucked shirts, I think they're slouchy, you know. Uh, if you can't fight and you're unarmed right now, if you have no woodman's skills or you're afraid of camping out, if you can't swim, if you can't ride a motorcycle, you don't travel, or if you do, it's very cautiously, if you have no tools or spare parts in your car, if you have more than 25% body fat, if you can't bench press your own weight, if you're under 55 taking Viagra, supplemental testosterone, if you online disrespect men hiding behind their adherence to the non-aggression principle. This happened to me online with the, uh, some New Hampshire people. Uh, back in the day when it was FSW, FSP, and a lot of acrimony on that, one guy on the forum called me a liar. I said, no, I, I may have been mistaken about something, but no, I, I was not consciously telling an untruth. Nah, you're, you're lying about that. I said, dude, you can't call me a liar. That's, that's big shit. Uh, I suggest we find the nearest boxing ring whenever I'm you know, on the East Coast and we'll, I'll find your reset button. And uh, he rah, 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 you know, moused his way out of it. A Couple years later, I'm at a Liberty Forum for the first time and I hear afterwards that he was there too 
but he was so scared of me, he turned his name tag around so I wouldn't read it. And I, I didn't recognize him in the thing. So, um, But he's hiding behind my non-aggression principles. If you have more female friends than male buddies, if you have no male-only male spaces to frequent, men need to spend time with men. Not just males with males, but men with men doing manly stuff, camping out, a boating trip, uh, going to a shooting school, building an airplane, just for the men. Cigars, whiskey, bad jokes, raunchy behavior, once in a while we need it. If you allow your woman to make uh, most of your decisions, if your woman is querulous and self-entitled, wow. If your woman successfully employs sexual denial, you know, that ain't cool. If your woman is fat and even fatter than you are, that, that's an in-your-face, uh, that, that's an insult, and she knows what she's doing. If you watch a lot of porn, you just might be a beta male. There was a book I just read about uh, financial investing and becoming wealthy pretty quickly and all that, and uh, it was a male author. <laughs> and in the dedication page, I, 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 it's just like, here, here it is. To my little son, Jack, I hope you'll always dance, stream, and follow your heart. I mean, it's something you say for your daughter. You don't say that for a son. I mean, it's the perfect recipe for raising a little sissy. And we got plenty of those. There is a rise of what I call heterophobia. You, know, you just can't be a regular, average, masculine Joe. It's going to be questioned. You're going to be uh, portrayed as a buffoon, trying to compensate, you know, whatever. Atlas is shrugging. The alpha males are shrugging. The alphas are getting tired of this shit. The first example I read that made an impression on me was uh, from World War II. I was reading a book about fighter pilots, and a guy was commanding a squadron. And he had one of his uh, aces come back, uh, four confirmed kills in the air. And he came back uh, from a 30-day leave in the States, and he wants to be transferred to the observation group, where you're just flying around, you know, looking at stuff and reporting. It's safe. It's non-combat. And the commander said, you know, why? You know, you're a fighter ace. You know, get back, get back into the fight. And he goes, nah. I was just in the States for 30 days. Everyone's whining about how much overtime they have to, you know, work, all the rationing of the food. And he goes, I don't want to fight for those people. I've done my bit, scrum. Alpha shrugging. Becoming an alpha male. Some beta males, it's going to be too late, but some are marginal. And, and you know, they just need a little bit of nudge and, you know, they can find their inner testosterone. Uh, I love Clint Eastwood's movies, Gran Torino, fantastic movie. Anybody see Gran Torino? You know, clueless kid next door, raised by women, no father, no older brother, gang members, you know, his only uh, influence, and, you know, Clint Eastwood takes him under his wing, shows him how to talk to a guy, you know, the scene at the hardware store, and then you know, he goes on the job site, and, uh, you know, his potential employers kind of feel him out, this kid. It's like, okay, what can you do? What's going on? Well, you know, I need a job because, you know, my transmission went out and, you know, the mechanic bit me over for two grand. Wow, two grand. Yeah, it ain't fair. You know, a bit of a male banter that Clint Eastwood character told him how to do. The kid had no idea. Clint Eastwood taught him how to, how to talk to girls, how to go on a date, lent him the car, you know, gave him tools for his new job. Gran Torino is a great, you know, synopsis of getting this poor beta male that would have been hopeless uh, without him. I haven't seen Clint's uh, newest movie, uh, 1517 to Paris. Anybody have seen that yet? You know, the heroic, uh, uh, you seen it? Is it good, Ernie? Yeah. Three American males with uh, a Frenchman uh, basically took down a terrorist with an AK-47 and prevented a slaughter, and they made a movie ab about it. Um, fantastic. Uh, if you've missed out on important male rites of passage, go back and complete them, even now. These are important. Hunting is, is a very big deal, actually. Gun ownership, shooting, and all that. But hunting uh, is a big deal. One of my books is about hunting, and I talk about that. Uh, the righteous taking of another life for food, for a noble purpose, for self-defense. Uh, hunting is uh, vital to that. It inculcates responsibility at an early age. I think a boy's first deer hunt should be anywhere from 12 to 15 years old. But you know, if you're 40 and haven't done it, meet up with men who are hunters and say, hey man, I haven't done this before. I know I missed something, you know, when I was an early age. Can you guys take me hunting? 
when I was in South Africa uh, years ago working on a game ranch, as an American, I could not take foreigners under my wing as a guide, but I could take South Africans. And so this architect had come with his uh, buddies who were meat hunters from Johannesburg, and they get basically white-tailed deer of South Africa, take it back in a trailer and have a lot of meat. And uh, this young architect, about 35 years old, kind of got the bug. He goes, I'd like to try this. So he had never handled a gun, never shot a gun, never hunted. So I took him to the range with the old bolt action uh, 308, got him where he was pr proficient enough. And then the next day took him on a hunt and with the shooting sticks and got him up to uh, a herd of uh, Impala. And uh, he made a very nice shot. Uh, the animal went only 15 yards. It was a drop dead shot and a perfect experience for him. And I valued the fact that I got him to do that more than I think any animal that I've taken in Africa. That was more special to me bringing him into the fold that way than any hunting I've done. Um, become an actual master at something. Learn where and how not to give a shit. That is a real powerful tool as a human being, but especially for a man. Strive to become a walking solution to any problem. Do not allow others to reimagine manhood for you. Do not befriend, sleep with, date, marry a third wave butchy feminist. It will save a lot of uh, misery that way. Stop being so compliant and agreeable, especially with women. Do not permit even a single molecule of undeserved contempt or disrespect from your woman. She can be angry at you. She can have her moods. You can screw up and do something. But it can't be contemptuous because contempt is a real killer of relationships. And I went through one where the contempt became like acid after a while. And it started off slowly. I didn't know what was going on, but uh, I figured it out later. And uh, anger is one thing. Get over anger. But you can't get over mocking, jeering, rolling your eyes, you know, you idiot, you know, that kind of thing. Can't get over that. Stop playing it safe. Ships are safe in harbors, but that's not what ships are for. Get out there and risk yourself and do something. Start to take risks with your life and property and reputation. Buy that motorcycle. Don't ask. Just buy it and ride it home. Go embark on the adventure. Sail to Tahiti. Go hunt in Africa. Go scuba dive. That's that Spanish uh, galleon off the coast of Florida. Um, ride the motorcycle down to Cabo. Do manly things with other men. That's real important, especially if someone's kind of an introvert or they live um, off the grid, they don't have much contact. Um, go seek out men to do something, and it's important for everyone. Stand up for what you love and what you know to be right. Winston Churchill said, courage is the first of human qualities because it makes all the other qualities possible. It guarantees all the other ones. And in conclusion, think of it this way. An unarmed man can only flee from evil, but evil is never overcome by fleeing from it. Beta males cannot confront evil because they can't do anything against it. They can only run. They can only go to the island or try to become invisible or stay under the radar. They don't confront anything. As my comic friend Rick Overton said, it's like we've got Alzheimer's. We've forgotten how to be brave. <laughs> I love that one. Alzheimer's. Fear kills more people than death. And you've got two choices in life, fear or mastery. So I would urge you all to face your fear and live your dreams. You're going to rarely go wrong doing the manly thing because the manly thing is almost always the courageous thing. And the right thing is always going to require courage. If the right thing didn't require courage, everyone would be doing the right thing. But the right thing is difficult, and it usually takes some guts to do it. Cowardice asks, is it safe? Expedience asks, is it political? Vanity asks, is it popular? Conscience asks, is it right? And only a person of courage or a man of courage can act out of his conscience. Conscience and courage go together. So for the sake of us all, if you're a beta male, man the hell up for yourself and for the rest of us. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions, please go, go for it. Yeah. Uh, two questions. One, do you, 
ask, uh, do you recognize a sort of social engineering conspiracy that's taking place right now with the elites pushing and unnaturally <clears throat> expanding the beta male, the gender non-binary, playing this up, and there's like BPA and water, right. estrogen, feminization. Sure. And then the second question is, do you feel, gay. what's that? The big frogs gay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do you, uh, do you feel that perhaps there's um, opportunity for like a new, evolved, enlightened masculine that is this rugged, individualist courage, but is also deeply in touch with his own feminine side and his own emotions? to kind of help us towards a spiritual evolution that doesn't always have to be as combative, so to speak. Right. Um, let me answer your second one uh, first. Uh, being masculine doesn't mean that you're just a hard ass and a man and, and, and strong everywhere you go. The uh, samurai, for example, balanced their martial arts uh, skills and their temper with calligraphy, arranging flowers, writing poetry, uh, things like that. They realized that there's the yin and yang of life and they didn't shy away from the feminine side. I mean, we're all born from men and women. And so, yeah, there's nothing wrong with being soft. Uh, C.S. Lewis talked about the knight has, has smashed in faces. He knows violence to the nth, nth degree. But when he's a guest in the hall, he's almost demure like a maiden. He's polite. He's a gentleman. He knows the softer way of dealing things in life. And there's no, uh, there's no uh, exclusion to that, so sure. Now, as far as uh, social engineering, absolutely. You'd think if, there, if, if all this was by accident, just the way things are, that occasionally uh, good thinking, libertarian principles, manly behavior would accidentally be propagated or supported. It never is. Everything really is against masculinity and manhood because our elite, our rulers know that's the only threat that there is. And so they reduce the testosterone from the men, they add some to the women, and so there's not enough in butchy third way feminists to fight a revolution, and the men have not enough left to kick off a revolution anyway. So yeah, I believe it's absolutely intentional. And it's very subtle and it's the very large forces. I think George Soros is, is deeply aware of, of that and what he's doing, so. Do you think it's like a global thing? It yeah. would be in the benefit of a nation state to have strong warriors. But sure. They're just right. trying to be a global word. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, European men are, are hopeless for the most part. Uh, the only ones that stand up to anything are, are the skinheads, and that you know gives manhood a bad name because uh, it looks like it's just that. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, what, uh, one of the things I'm noticing is we've been here, and it's already happened in the workplace. Right. But it's now getting to a point where men cannot approach women. Anymore. Right. And, and you know, and I, I I I saw a witch hunt last year against a man who was only crime really was just having bad games. Right, right. Uh, and you know, and, and you know, he, and he had a Charlie Brown button. He was late, but I don't think he was doing anything to hurt anybody. He was just that way. It's like, okay. and, and it's just, I, I sometimes wonder if men should just get up and leave. I don't know, go to South America or something. <laughs> yeah, I've wondered that too. I've been to South America, and you know, there's a healthy, healthy, there's a healthy balance between men and women down there. Uh, yeah, men can be pigs. You know, we all got that. But women know how to handle men who are pigs down there. Also, the ones who were leading these witch hunts, it wasn't just women. It's also men who were leading these witch hunts against other men. Right, right. I just, I think eventually some of these guys are going to rise up and beat the crap out of these guys. Because once those guys, once the male feminists are out, feminism will collapse. Right. It will. Right. But, you know, yeah, no, it's a fine line to tread and, uh, you know, try not to live where, you know, that sort of stuff is prevalent, I guess. So, yeah, I'm a hermit author in the mountains, so I have the luxury of saying that. Right, Austin. One last question. Anybody? I'd like to know what uh, you think the women response to what you say. I've, I've generally had, um, and my book, my, my talk is about uh, encapsulating uh, 1,600 pages of three volumes of books which are out there on the table. I've generally had, meaning like 80% plus uh, positive response. In fact, someone, a woman last night who's here in the audience said, thank you, you know, for doing what you're trying to do. Because as I hear it, women are tired of weak-ass men. 
you know, they're, they're just worthless. They're worthless in the family, probably worthless in bed, they're worthless in society. And, you know, women don't want to be uh, controlled or, or be tyrannized, but there's nothing wrong with a healthy, manly husband. And the, the word husband is a verb, to husband, right? To manage. And if you do that in a healthy sense, there's nothing demeaning about a, a wife cooking dinner for her husband as he's done the brake job for her car. You know, it's a division of labor. It's just no big deal. Um, yeah, but it's not black and white that way. No, but in the in the general well, sense that in the general yeah. sense that I can make a, a you know make a talk about it. Uh, you know, it's it, it's distinct. But sure, there are gray areas and so forth. But you know, find who you know. Everybody has to find what what works for them. But in general, I think men enjoy being men and women enjoy being women and pair bonding with uh, healthy examples of each and having great children. And, you know, you got a, a great family. So anyway, thanks for all coming. And I'm downstairs with my books. Thank you all.